Perfect. Uh, welcome everyone for the Cloud, in Cloud Native Computing Needs Meetup. Uh, we are happy to be back after two months of holidays. Yeah, uh, I was really looking forward to, to get back to it. If you do not follow us, uh, we have a page on community.cncf.io slash links and also uh, Twitter, Cloud Native Links. And if you're participating and you want to share something, please tag us to help us grow the community. Um, the agenda, we are already a little bit late, but I'll do the welcome. Then we'll pass the, the, the stage to Lars. He will have a talk and then around 45, 5.45, we have a Q&A, then some closing remarks. And we are already announcing the next one. So stay tuned for, for more uh, about that. It's exciting news. Um, we, as part of the CNCF community, we follow the CNCF code of conduct. Um, that in summary means that everyone is welcome. Doesn't matter your uh, level, your color, your gender, uh, your anything. Um, everyone is welcome. So whenever referring to someone, please make sure you are being kind in the way that you do, because that's what we, we want to have here as a, a community. If you want to know more about the, the code of conduct, we have the link here. Um, but basically, be kind to everyone and everyone is welcome. Um, the meetup is organized by me. I'm a software engineer at Dynatrace, and here's my Twitter handle. And also, Jürgen. Uh, Jürgen, you want to say hi? Yes, hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, nice to be back after um, a summer break uh, from, from, uh, with, with this meetup. Uh, I also uh, happen to work at Dynatrace, uh, same as uh, Juliana. Uh, and uh, I'm not um, directly working on the, on the Dynatrace uh, product, but I'm working on uh, Captain, which is one of our open source projects. And it's actually also a CNCF project. Right now we're in Sandbox, we are going uh, we are currently in the process of going to um, incubation or becoming an incubating uh, project in the CNCF. And my role in Captain is, uh, is caring about the Captain ecosystem, working together with other uh, projects in the CNCF, um, like currently working on a demo with uh, Crossplane. So it's always interesting to, to also learn more in this kind of meetup. So I'm really excited to, to learn from Lars uh, what he's uh, going to share today. And yeah, welcome back everyone to this meetup. <laughs> Uh, cool. So, if you would like to talk uh, to the to one of our events, we have a form, uh, a Google form. It's pretty simple. You just need to fill up the your contact and the uh, abstract. And to make your life easier, tinyurl.com/cnclinks-talk. And if you're a company and would you like to sponsor uh, a meetup. Have your brand here, help us grow the community, get some uh, gifts for, for the members. Uh, tinyurl.com slash CNC links sponsor. Um, yeah, that's it. And also, if you want to get the discussion going on after the meetup, we are um, we are part of a Discord server, CNC links dash Discord, and you get the invite to it. You can join us and have a chat there. And yeah, so today's speakers, Lars Wolf or Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> and he's uh, today a uh, director of performance testing at Stormforge, but he was also the founder of Stormforger. But uh, maybe he can uh, give some, uh, a little brief about that in his talk. So, uh, Lars, the stage is all yours. All Thank right. you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. So it's always a new thing that Zoom is reallocating all the windows when you share the screen <laughs> on multiple <laughs> chapters. So give me a second. All righty. You see my window, right? 
the slides? Uh, no, we, well, we it see like a, a, a test stream. Uh, a test like, build. Yeah, back yeah. in the old days, it was a test build, yeah. The old <laughs> test build, yeah. <clears throat> okay, um, yeah, thanks again for having me. By the way, it's a pity that I did not move over to Linz. I've never been there, sometimes in Vienna, of course. But yeah, as you all know, the pandemic and so on and so forth. Um, my talk, and I hope you all read the abstract, is uh, called Automatically Optimized Cloud Native Systems for Fun and Profit. And I want to ask you that you please excuse that, that easy theme of for fun and profit, but I actually try to bring that around the whole talk. So I hope that works because I reworked the talk just yesterday. All right. Um, before we really get into the, the whole topic, we have to set some base ground and that base ground is in generally speaking complexity. And whenever I talk about complexity, I really love to show that picture. Uh, by the way, you do me a favor if you just um, turn on your video because then I see, still can see faces and even so that this is a virtual meetup, it's important to get some feedback. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay. so. I'm pretty sure that any one of you is familiar with that. It's the, the Cloud Native Foundation uh, landscape. It pretty much shows all of the projects and, and accredited or certified uh, vendors of the Cloud Native Foundation. And the reason why I really like that, that picture is if we just look at it and see all the, the shiny, shiny logos, we realize, okay, there's a lot of solutions for a lot of problems. And that's, Remind, that reminds me about the complexity we actually dealing with every day. So most of the people I met in the last years do not have like just a single website where they deliver one to three pages or something like that. They have actually complicated business models and complicated systems and huge system at all. And we have to deal with that complexity. And that's, a, I think, like most of the time, a very strange thing. Obviously, and I learned product pitching, I mean, I know that product pitching at, at, at user groups is not nice. So please give me a bad buzzer if you have the feeling that there's too much product pitching. But however, when I show that picture, I always have to draw that red arrow. So if you look down there, you these black pixels, you see the Envil, which is our logo. And again, we are just one tiny solution for a specific problem. And when you build your systems, I'm pretty sure that you will use one of the products in each of the single boxes here. Keep in mind, complexity is there. And it's, I don't know, it, it's not a good thing. <laughs> I not really know how to judge it right. <laughs> Giuliano is understanding me as an engineer, right? <laughs> okay. Um, by the way, since we right now are three people, so Roland, Marcos, Christoph, you can just stop me anytime if you have any questions, just to say that. So if we get more people, then maybe it's getting complicated, but if you just want to stop me as long as we, so, so, so it's such a small crowd, then that's totally fine. A bit about myself, I'm Lars. There was a time when I was an engineer too. At some point in time, somebody had to take care about business that role fall, fall in, my, in my hands and I had to do this. I also did agile coaching before, and um, I was funding uh, founding a company called Stormforger uh, in 2014 with uh, Sebastian Kohn, and that's a software as a service for load and performance testing. And last year in 2020, we merged with a company from the US at that time called Carbon Relay, and Carbon Relay actually had the problem that they realized that they that's not so easy to actually run Kubernetes setups. Most importantly, it's not easy to run them in an efficient way. And these people are great machine learning heads, as I call them. And that was kind of a perfect fit coming with generated data and applying machine learning to that to create a new solution. Nevertheless, we, called, we are called Stormforge today. So the German team lost the R at the end. <laughs> That's everything. Um, obviously, things like that is, has been done for clients. I'm very proud of all the cl clients here. It doesn't matter if they're from Europe or from the US, and we are an AWS partner. Again, most of the things I will talk about, of course, I will somehow tell about this in the context of, of performance testing and our optimization tooling. 
but you can apply this in general thinking. And if you think it's too much about product, then just give me a sign and I'll try to zoom out and get it more, get it on a more high level, okay? So when we're building systems and when we're deploying system and run the systems, and I hope you all agree, at one time, point in time, we have to be facing one of the following challenges. So the challenge of how fast is my system, the performance challenge, and I actually do not know anyone who wants to have a, a slow system. So this is not fun. And then we talk about, we have to talk about uh, scalability and we face scalability issues. And scalability is one of the main facts why we actually move to so-called dynamic environments. Does not, doesn't matter if this is virtualization like back in the days or the cloud or even Kubernetes today. Um, we're doing that because we want to gain the, all the profits and all the benefits from scalability using the right resources at the right time. And that's a um, complicated thing, especially in bigger distributed systems. So third thing is reliability. Often put in place as the same with availability. Actually, these both are not to distinguish really hard and you can put them together. However, reliability, for developers and operations people, and also for people for the business, this is just not negotiable. Any ops person here or a person with an ops background knows what I'm talking about, that it's not no fun at all when you get paged at night and there was this other team deploying something which was just not reliable. And this is something to avoid, despite the fact that um, from an economic thinking, this is like the pure horror. And last but not least, it's about the efficiency of the system. Efficiency is often called uh, and this, at the same time with cost efficiency. And that's true because efficiency in the end man, means how much money do you spend for, for a specific task or a specific thing to do. However, uh, I'm personally not so much interested in cost savings and more important in having the transparency, how much do we spend on a specific thing and why do we do that? And does this make sense to the, to the business at all? Business as, at all? So I was saying that story that um, I've seen a lot that people realized, okay, they spend, have big cloud costs and when they just improve something and are, are making the system more efficient that they realize, okay, we now have free budgets to spend on other innovative innovation projects or moving forward something or hire some more people. However, dealing with efficiency in distributed systems is also no fun at all. How to face these challenges? So actually, in general speaking, you can say, first of all, you have to gain an, and gain an understanding of the general behavior of, of your application. And having complexity in mind and having in mind that we are working on large distributed systems, this, this is not really easy to put like the uh, general behavior of a system under a specific load, for example, or in production in just one human head. It's actually something which you have to get a gut feeling for, you have to test it out, you have to do edge uh, testing. And I mean, maybe today kind of chaos engineering and do experiments where you find out what, how does the, the system actually behave. And secondly, and this is something which actually is in my observations, very, very, very complicated is that you have to create a common ground of your, as we call it from a technical perspective, non-functional requirements, of course. So um, it's a different thing what an individual in a team is thinking about the requirements for a system than what the team which is running or creating that whole, that whole component maybe uh, is thinking about the non-functional requirements. And also it's a to totally different thing what the business wants. And uh, it's not that easy to find that common ground, but you need that common ground to actually make the right decisions when it comes to improvement. And that's the last point gather enough insights and gather enough data to make informed decisions so that you actually can decide, okay, we do not do that improvement because it will not help us much or it is not about the business need or it does not bring us uh, uh, one step forward. And also the same with optimizations in general. Spoiler here for all the people who ever face these challenges and work on that, there are a lot of trade-offs to make. Um, I have to ask one question. So maybe you can answer that in the, in the chat or you can even just raise your hand or so. Um, who of the people here are doing regular load and performance tests? And also another question, the same, uh, do you run it in Kubernetes? You can answer that in, in the chat. It's just like for my reflection. 
because the thing is, and I want to come back to the complexity for, for a second, you maybe have seen that I uh, sent out this Twitter poll and I'm not the best social media person. So maybe 10 words is not the best uh, result for Twitter poll. However, um, there 50% of the people said that reliability and availability is the most important things uh, to work on. And that's, uh, by the way, um, one um, confirmation that most of these challenges are kind of interdependent. That means you cannot have like high availability if you do not know about the, the efficiency of your system or the performance of your system. So these, these, these pillars are interdependent and you have to really gain an understanding on what depends on what in your situation. Totally use case depending by the way. All right, how to really face these challenges how to gain that observability, that that uh, that um, understanding of the behavior, how to gain data. Um, one tool for that job is actually load and performance testing. That's I, I'm saying for years. This is not really a new cool thing or something. It's pretty common to do that, but the uh, the the cool or new thing is that it's getting more and more important when we're running more, yeah, workloads in so-called dynamic environments. I I have a strange feeling with if it's the right term to say the cloud or Kubernetes only because I think people run it in, in different environments. So I'm, I'm kind of uh, pinpointed to use the term dynamic environments. Please excuse that. So how to do that? Usually you have to install and use a load generator for our service. This is signing up for the software as a service. You have to create a test case a test scenario for us you define you can define using our you can define a user journey and or an api journey using our javascript dsl then you have to find some sensible traffic pattern which you want to use to apply to to the system with that done you most of the time want to have some some things we know from functional testing which are creating some checks, checks, specific, checks for specific requests and responses, check for, uh, do some assertions and definitely create some non-functional requirements. So I assume that most of the people know about non-functional requirements. These can get really, really complicated, but usually you say something like, I, I want to make sure that in 99%, so in the 99 percentile of uh, all the requests, a specific endpoint or a specific component will respond in that and that response time, or is available in for so much uh, percent, whatever and however you define it, depends on your use case as well. So when you've done that, you run that test. And with running that test, you come to, obviously to the first problem, you have to make sure that you have something to run the test on. So you're now creating your own infrastructure to make sure that you can run the load test or you're using a service like, like ours, for example. With the test running, usually this is kind of a boring situation, but you should look in your own observability tools and, and, and inspect your own system because you should see the traffic and you should realize, okay, something is working or not working. And with the final report of the load test, you definitely have the chance to do the inspections and you will have some findings. So I've never seen a team in all the years which did not have any findings. And they are like kind of top 10 uh, classic findings, which all of the teams will have in the very beginning. And if it's easy like that, that they realize that they do not take care about the right HTTP status codes in their system, which is a very common use, use case or problem out there in the field. All right. Let's say we have that finding and we decide to improve that, we improve that finding. That also means that we then redeploy the system and that we have to run another test to actually validate if that, that finding really improved our problem. <clears throat> Sorry, the improvement really improved our, our finding. And also to make sure that we have no, no new side effects, which maybe yeah, slows down, down the system at, in, another, in, in another point or another component. And with that, we actually start over to an iterative approach. So by the way, excuse the basic joke here. I, you, I hope you all understand that you cannot copy that or run this directly. Uh, so we have to go to 30 again. We obviously refine the test scenario. We probably refine the, the, the traffic pattern because we learned something about that. We then run new tests and we have new findings because we 
um, by iteration over iteration and we moved one step further to like kind of the perfect um, scenario or the perfect test of the use case or the perfect test of the of the system under test and with that said it's very important that we have the possibility that this is done in like in i would say don't name me down in that wording but like kind of a modern mindset so the times are over that we can throw something like that over the wall to like a classic QA team. And I'm not judging the QA people here. I'm just saying that this must be done in a cross-functional way. So we have to make sure that we um, can create a new feature, introduce a new endpoint. Maybe we do the functional test. We also maintain, improve, or create a test scenario for non-functional test performance in this case here. And we can start this immediately and make sure that we can run this easily. And the last point, I seriously have to emphasize that, but it's not that uncommon that teams out there wait because of the tooling hours or even days for the report, because somebody has to look in the reports on a manual way and then you receive back like a, a, a big uh, staple of papers where you can check out the findings. And I think this is not like the right time anymore in 2021 to do it like this. However, if we're there, if we have this iterative approach going over this, uh, making sure that we improve the test cases like the functional test, and you all know how much pain in the ass that was back in the days when we were used to start with the functional testing, then we probably are happy DevOps. And I tried to find a good picture for happy DevOps. I actually did not really find one. So they, I realized, okay, Shlomo, a guy from Germany, which you maybe check out and read his blog uh, as mentioned here in the Google search. And also I realized, I don't know about you, but we don't have colleagues which are so smart and nice looking people like these and, um, and really like doing party when they are in luck. So these are stock people and this is, totally wrong, but I decided to just use this picture and explain that to you. Hope that is fun. Okay, when we happy and when we in that iterative approach, we are in the situation that we then realize, okay, damn, there are new problems inside. Who could have known that? I mean, we know how it works. We start with one thing, we go deeper and deeper and deeper and realize, okay, it's even getting more complicated. So the problem here which we realize, which starts to bore us is that manual testing, I mean, it's still like, even if it's iterative, it's kind of manual testing. It's a lot of effort and it's a lot of uh, time. It's, it's super time consuming. And also we have the problem that when we do test, let's say like every week or every quarter or like back in the days, every half a year, or even just one time a year or every release at that time that we, um, realize, okay, probably the state of the test case itself, the user journey, the test data is kind of out of date because there's too much time between uh, like the, the time of generation of the test data and um, the time when you will run the test. And the most important fact is that your system under test, like the system you apply the test against the so-called SUT will definitely have changed. And I mean, this is a good, thing, by the way, like we all strive to ship fast on a regular basis. And I really appreciate that. And we should move on with that, like moving towards continuous deployments and stuff like this. But it also means that we have to make sure that we, when we do testings, that we have like the, the same situation on the other side, that we have a main, good maintained test scenario and test data. And I hope this is kind of obvious, but at that point, like automate all the things will come in place again. So automation, by the way, is fun. All the other points are not that much fun if you think about that. But this obviously needs some, some effort, some initial effort to do that. And I already described that. It also means that we have kind of a shift in the, in the, in the thinking about our processes that we come in a development or an engineering movement like hey, we introduced that new endpoint, we do the functional testing and also the non-functional testing. And by the way, the same applies for security. And this is the same thing which happens right now that we realize, okay, we will not do an audit every release or, or every build, but we will have some basic checks on, on specific uh, security problems. If this is static code analysis or if this is just like checks for vulnerabilities. And this is like the, the, the shift in the mind we have to force for all the teams out there. However, 
um, doing this, taking the time will make you a bit more happy, a bit more happy DevOps, of course. Uh, sorry, I have to repeat that because when I had that search, I did not, I did not have any motivation anymore to search for another picture for that. And <clears throat> again, at the same point, it's kind of the same story, it's repeating. So we realize, okay, there's another problem. So if you gain some more confidence with testing or load and performance testing, and when you get more confidence or more understanding of the behavior of your application, you also realize that 80 to 90% of the problems which you see and the findings you have are based in some kind of misconfigurations. And by the way, please don't name me down on that number. It's more like a gut feeling from all the years. And it's very hard to actually write down that number. I seriously tried that, but it's really hard to do this. But most of the time, um, the problem is configuration. And having configuration problems is no fun at all, of course, because we first of all have to identify what kind of configuration is the problem. And then we have to deal with all the, the huge number of permutations we have of different configurations we should or can use. And we then have to test that again. At that point, we have automatic optimization to the rescue. That means we need something which helps us to deal with the huge amount of different configuration permutations in a way that it runs tests, that it realizes, okay, this is a bad configuration for my non-functional requirements. It hopefully redeploys that that system and test that again and make sure that a new applied configuration is better than the one before. But thinking of that, it means it is a, it is a very, very time consuming, long manual test sessions. Um, we, can make a, we can use an easy example. Let's say we just want to, to uh, allocate the right amount of CPU and the right amount of memory to one part in, in our application. You can do the math for yourself, but if you're thinking about that, you know that you have to test out a lot of different permutations of configurations to find the right one. And from the field, I can tell you, I watched teams doing that and it took weeks for the whole team. And this is what was no fun at all for them to do that. They had their reasons and the reasons were right, but this is nothing which is like, should be done on a day-to-day -day basis. And also you can argue that there's no, not, not a, a strong reason to do optimization on a continuous way. I would argue that it is because we are still at the very beginning on being very, very fast in the change of the systems we are actually creating. So we're getting, the organizations are getting bigger and bigger and they're push, pushing out more changes to the system and the system will be on a continuous change or is still on, the, on, a, on a continuous change of its own state. However, a solution for that is that you install the Stormforge command line client that you just log in and that you apply Stormforge run. And then our product Optimize comes into play and Optimize helps you to define a so-called experiment. That experiment needs an, an objective and some components to apply against in your Kubernetes cluster. And this objective is, for example, um, is for example that cost is more important to you than throughput for that for that specific components you used in the cluster or you want to apply the experiments again and the that commando helps you to 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 define that and also it runs that experiment and and it helps you to watch that so what does that experiment do basically it is the automation of applying a new configuration to that to that pod redeploys that runs a load test for a specific time with the defined traffic pattern, learns the data and then decides, okay, is this a good or a bad configuration or allocation of CPUs and memories as in my example for, for my objective. And if not, it just stops, cancels the test run, moves on to the next possibility. We can do that easily. Let just like write down all the permutations, run through it and take some months to do this. And that's the, the point where actually machine learning comes into play. So you can think of that the behind laying machine learning model helps us to do very smart search across all the, or the big space of all the permutation that learns, hey, the permutations, let's say like with high CPU and low memory do not work. So let's move away from these kind of configuration permutations to maybe the opposite direction. And it kind of tested out 
the complete space to come up with with um, with um, all the candidates which are um, yeah from the test results point of view good candidates to de to deploy. So the important thing here is that we now have a place uh, a system in place which first of all makes sure that we automatically run this this test series, but most importantly, we can access all the data of all the test runs and we actually have nothing to do with that. And also we get some recommendation at say a handful of candidates as I call them, which are like, look like that they fit the objective. And the full control is still at the user or the ops person who can realize, okay, it looks to me comparing the data that this is maybe a good candidate to really deploy to the production uh, the next time. And um, yeah, uh, I, I'm just looking if I, <laughs> so you see the best one with the trademark. So obviously um, these are recommendations. The quality is pretty good, but it's very important for me that we still have the full control to the human being. So, I mean, I can imagine that a system like this can, is deploying a whole de uh, production for that for itself, but I don't still don't like that idea. It's like, I still think that there must be some control at the humans where they understand, okay, why do we do that change? What is the configuration? Why are we striving in that direction? And some kind of control, at least at, at like a kind of a high, let's call it management, management level. Okay. In my example, I was talking about one part. And if you want, I don't know about you, but usually people don't run one part in a Kubernetes cluster, right? <laughs> And, <laughs> and so now the problem gets really dirty because if you want to start optimized manually with doing manual test runs, like your whole system, you have to decide what is the first component, how to start with that. And you have to go through all the parts and probably all the systems. This will take ages. I mean, by ages, I mean really ages, like years, if you just count that time. And that's the thing, like the machine learning model helps us that we uh, that we um, apply that, let's call it smart search on, on the configuration to a lot of parts at the same time, or even the, the, the whole application. And it's not bound to apply that to only one, only CPU or, or resource limits in general. We, you can also that apply to applications which are running at that and that part. And I think, and now I stopped using that happy DevOps image. I think from that point on the, the, point, the, the whole situation, is getting fun again. We actually have the possibility to get rid of all the things who will make our head explode, which are not fun at all. And obviously behind that is profit. And not only profit in the sense of optimization and cost savings, but profit in the sense of that we actually gained a lot of experience with our own system, our complex system based on data and that we actually know why we can, why we should make the one or the other trade off and why we uh, yeah, basically do the informed decision. Alrighty, so I started with complexity. I obviously have to end with complexity and I'm still saying we have to find ways to somehow control that complexity. And from the sphere, from the challenges I was talking in the very beginning, I would say that this is one of the ways to go. I don't think that anyone should spend time, a lot of time on manual testing. We had that before with functional testing. It was bad habit. It's better now. We still are in the, in the progress of moving away from this for, for non-functional testing, for performance testing here. And I also think that no one should spend any time on manual optimization. Of course, there are business cases out there which are very create scope where you can focus on that, but that is real performance engineering. When it comes to running a, a, a large system where you have to make sure that you have the, the right resources allocated and that you have the right performance and also the right um, mobility, nobody should do that manually. And also I think, and maybe this is the most important thing on that here. I mean, we should focus on the things which we are which on we are really good at. And this is usually something around engineering and operations and for the people from the business side doing their business and not doing manual testing. And by the rest, I, by the way, I have to admit performance testing in the end is kind of boring. <laughs> like you do tests and you look at, look at load generators creating traffic and then you, you end up with a report. To sum that finally up, 
I think continuous performance, te performance testing is a must have to face the challenges for, of performance and scalability and reliability and efficiency. And also it's the times or there is no time to actually do manual, um, manual optimization. And the reason for that is the, the rising complexity. So we do not have the time to optimize single components in the system. We want to deploy fast. We want to make sure that we move forward fast and we also have to apply technology um, to, to do that for us because simply in, in that sphere of, uh, of uh, complexity, the human being is just not even capable anymore to control that. And that's a bonus. Usually I talk a lot about that topic uh, with my agile coaching background, but I, I, I kind of did not do that here in, in, in that talk now. But the bonus is that when you have all the data and when you have the right tooling, you are in the situation that you basically democratize the knowledge about the behavior of your the system itself, the capabilities of the system, and you make sure that there is a good connection between the business needs and the technical capabilities and possibilities and how to move forward and improve that to make sure that there are less silos on that topic. And for the people from QA, you know that there are a lot of silos when it comes to QA in general. And obviously, we all strive, want to strive for operational excellence, which is like the propagated thing to do. And I, by the way, agree with that. All right. Most importantly, don't forget to have fun. So there are a lot of no fun at all parks, but don't forget to have fun. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I wrote that in my abstract. Um, most important for me is the Q&A. So I'm happy to discuss anything, even if it's not related to the talk. Just enjoy the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lars. It, it was fun. I, I was just wondering here, is happy DevOps a thing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so the, the story is yesterday I was thinking, okay, how to describe that state of the team? And it, obviously it's happiness because the people are, are kind of rid of like the, the repeatable tasks and, and kind of rid of like the, the, the unfunny tasks. And, and I just typed in happy DevOps. <laughs> and, I mean, obviously it's not a thing because there are no pictures at all on the internet on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we, well, I raised one question and, um, there is another question from, from Marcus. So my question is, do you have any example of this configuration? Like, uh, how that works and like in, in a real scenario, but maybe the Marcus question is, uh, funnier to answer, oh. not funnier, but cooler to answer. Uh, yeah, your your answer is pretty easy. So there is a GitHub repository, the Stormforge. There's a, I mean, there's an example repository there. You can see a lot of examples. Then you have like two ways to to dive into that. You, you can of course use our documentation. But the first thing is the experiment definition, which is a YAML file, and it's a huge one. And then there's a, a more high level thing, which is the app YAML this um, more controls like on a high, higher level with, with less details. And you can check that out on GitHub. By the way, it's a good reminder. I did not mention any URL in this talk. So you find stuff, <laughs> our documentation, we have a website, guess what? We have a website, there's a documentation, we have a GitHub repository. And by the way, I have an email. This is last at Stoneforge. I you can ask me anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Okay, Michael or Marcus, what's yeah. your question? So he, he asked here in the chat, uh, what kind of machine learning is used for the optimization? For instance, evolutionary strategy, Bayesian optimization, mixed with integ integer programming, etc. Okay, so first thing, that's magic sauce, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, I will tell you some about it if I even had more information about that. And honestly, I'm not a machine learning person, but I'm very serious with that. I'm happy to connect you with, uh, the, with our machine learning people, even our CTO. They love to talk about that and they are very open to discuss the approach, seriously. So just maybe you just can send me your email like in, in a private chat or something. And I'm happy to, do, to connect you with John or Tivo or somebody else. It's good to know nothing about that because whenever somebody asks a question, like I can go like, I, I don't know anything, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Actually, uh, I, I would also have a question. Uh, maybe it's related to uh, to this one. But what uh, what is like the hello world of of an optimization? Uh, so what what is like the let's say the standard use case that you usually discover? Or if I want to get started, what should I bring? And what can I expect of uh, in terms of optimization? Will it be uh, a tweak in the, uh, in, the, in the deployment manifest? Will it be uh, I, I guess you cannot really update the the, the source code or like. Uh, um, do some yeah, optimization there, but what, what is the, let's say, hello world of optimization? Yeah, um, so in my point of view, and this is arguable, maybe the, the easiest thing is just like allocation of resource limits. Okay. Because I would say, I mean, this is like kind of the hello world. Anyone is kind of dealing with that. All of the, when, when you have the chance to decide for that, you take the highest numbers, right? <laughs> So you can imagine that there is potential. So um, I, I was jumping back to that slide because there is this saying, and it is true. I mean, even if it sounds like a marketing number, but it is true that we see like 50% of reduction in costs and this on a usual basis. The thing is that if you really think about that and you can discuss this even with the FinOps Foundation, that the thing is that most of the time a lot of resources are just over over provisioned and it's i would say like right now it's pretty easy to get that nevertheless i would argue that even if you know about 10 or 20 percent optimization when it comes to resources then this is a good thing to know i'm not saying that you have should spend month work on that but with the initial effort given i mean you need a test case for doing performance tests anyway it is helpful for you so if you come in that motion that helps you anyway. If you now apply uh, optimization on that, why not running that on, on a continuous basis? And I mean, even if it's just like every two weeks, you will have some findings. And I mean, it's not a problem at all that you just, I mean, it's running in the background. It, background, it does not take any time from you. Uh, what would you, um, or what is your thought on running this on a, a serverless basis, like in Lambda or Azure Function? <laughs> So that you only pay while it's running, or <laughs> it's an obvious question. So I guess you yeah. you you got this question a lot of times already. <laughs> yeah, Jürgen, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in in our product management, I'm Team Pro. Make serverless uh, auto, uh, optimization automatically happen. <laughs> so the thing is, and this is obviously from from my personal background in performance testing. A lot of our clients who are using serverless have a massive problems with doing, the, doing that, like having the right configuration because you have so many knobs. And also, I mean, from, from a perspective of a distributed system, serverless, since it's so small and so massive, you feel the impact of distributed systems directly. So if you only want make one mistake, you feel it directly, latest in your build. And that's why I'm still saying that this is a, is a thing to do. Honestly, our main focus right now is uh, Kubernetes only. And if you, if you run your own fast, of course, we can talk about that. I mean, as long as you can patch the configuration, then we can patch the configuration. That's it. Cool. So, but there is no AWS Lambda trademark automatic optimization yet. I will fight for it, Jürgen. <laughs> By the way, is this video is will this video go public? <laughs> uh, yeah, usually, usually uh, we we publish it. <laughs> Let yeah, us know no if problem. we shouldn't. <laughs> no problem. All my colleagues know about that. <laughs> um, Lars, I think I I have another question. If some, if nobody is asking anything, well, go ahead. Um, uh, quite. Um, do you? By you, I mean Stormforge. The uh you have some integrations with other tools? I mean, can your report send data to another tool that uh, in that other tool with the data that I get, I can automate some stuff and then make my life even easier? Yeah, so first thing, I mean, for the performance testing product, first of all, it's important that you can get all the reporting data. So in our UI, we, to be honest, we only uh, show some of them. The reason is very simple. Most of the people who start with that are fine with the data they see there, but whatever data you need, you can get that. 
then I mean it's an obvious idea to think about to re-import that data from a load test to another system. But honestly, it's not so much a useful as you maybe think, because you have the full and right data most of the time after the load test, because there must be done some data crunching. And also it's more importantly that you, and this is something I would say, it's really important that you look in your own system. And for that, this is what we call integrations. It's actually just deep linking into, I don't know, the Dyna traces and data dogs and FDs of this world. So think of you start a test run, you run it, you hit the link, and you directly come to your predefined dashboard where you see the, the where you see the request IDs, can apply, can profit from your distributed tracing, and you switch from the outside view from our reporting to the inside view, which is more important than the outside view. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. And yeah. just to add there, German as we are, we do not create any plugins for, I don't know, Jenkins or Grafana or stuff like that. It's just like, it sounds crazy, but we're still saying, I mean, if you want to do that, do it. You're engineers. <laughs> Why should we <laughs> create this super complicated general, uh, general plugin for anything? Of course, this helps to make things like clicky clicky. But most of the time, people stop thinking about what is the real thing they want to, to, to have after that. And we actually learned at customers that it's more helpful for the customers when they're using our command line client to, for the self and implement, implementation in their pipeline. It's pretty easy. I mean, it's, it's a handful of commands you use. And they then start thinking how to do that. And it fits with their organizational approach and the teams who are working on that. And you probably know, I mean, when you start create the first plugin, plug you get a lot of hate from the others who don't like that plug, plugin. And I, I just don't want to be in that spot. <laughs> Everyone is right, you know? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, come on people. One last question. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> hmm. So I have one. Um. I already asked what's more, most important for you. And the answer was from the 10 votes, it was um, that reliability is most important. But what do you think in the complexity we're dealing with? What do you think when you're running Kubernetes stuff is the most important challenge you have to face right now? Not only from the challenges are, are presented, but what do you think is the most important problem? Or what is your, your experience on that? So what I hear a lot is that managing the platform, managing uh, Kubernetes itself is becomes more and more complicated. Uh, as, as workloads grow, you also need to deal with uh, policies, uh, resource consumptions, uh, DNS issues or whatever, like network is a huge topic. Uh, all of this, like we, we have a lot of uh, conversations where, where we hear the platform itself is challenging. It's really challenging. Heard that before, thank you. <laughs> another, another, another spot. Like from from the normal attendees, maybe like Marcus, Andreas, Christoph, Roland. What what do you think is the, like the most challenging thing when when running your app in Kubernetes? And even if you don't run an app in Kubernetes, what do you think is the most challenging thing? Ah, oh. okay. Alrighty. Yeah. No, no answers. Oh yeah. Maintenance. Got it. <laughs> Always good. Yeah, it's kind of like it's kind of the same like managing the platform, right? Like what what Jürgen was saying. Like keep it up and running first of all, but then making sure that you also get updates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I want to say Windows nodes, but I, I'll not. I, I don't want to enter in this topic. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. All righty. Cool. So, what, what do you usually see, Lars? Uh, what, what What is the most challenging? What, what yeah. So, well, um, um, I think I stopped my screen sharing. Sorry. Um. So what? 
what you said, like, there's the decision in the organization, let's do this. And then the people are actually kind of struggling with the so-called day zero and day one problem. Like, first of all, get it running. Do not mistake using or, or feeling comfortable with the processes to that. And also being kind of overwhelmed how much like side fields they have to work on to make sure that everything works. And honestly, I think like, like, Companies like like Giant Swarm, for example, or or MindCurve, they they do do a good help. And I mean, it's the same for for testing approaches. That at some point, I mean, you probably know people who do in Q and A for for I don't know ten or twenty years. And if I present a load generator to them, they're just starting laughing because they have so much experience, right? But it's very very um, complicated for them to transfer that knowledge to other people. And it's the same with, with I, I think, running Kubernetes. So there's a lot of special knowledge and of course experience, and you need people who have that experience and it's probably really hard to get started easily. Actually, I, I talked to one company where one person don't get started that for themselves and they grow to a three person team directly in SRE team. And they say they had no problems. I was like, I mean, seriously, I was like very skeptic if this will work. I mean, they're still online, so I think it worked. <laughs> but yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that how the technology decision impacts the organizational um, structure and the other way around. So this is really interesting, I think. Hard closing words. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark was asking again uh, if security hardening is a big issue in your opinion. I don't have a strong opinion on that, but I think security is always a big problem. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously, like, you have it in, in all, the, all over the place, right? You need the processes in the company, which is an organizational artifact. Then you have to make sure that you have like like day-to-day -to -day tooling, like the things I explained before, like things you integrate in your pipeline to do, I don't know, static code analysis or, or doing like vulnerability checks and stuff like this, but you still need the audits. And even like platforms like Kubernetes are like evolving. Like my, I mean, like it's, what is it? Three or four releases a year, right? So that shift, the shift of the release dates, right? And then you always have to do this over and over again. And again, I mean, since ever security is an issue, I mean, not an issue, but it's hard to really make your, your, your cluster or your system bulletproof. And I, by the way, I don't know anyone from the security scene who says, I mean, this thing is bulletproof. <laughs> Nobody ever would say that because they have this last one, two percent off they don't know. <laughs> and like if they say maybe they are challenging someone so exactly <laughs> <laughs> cool uh lars thank you very much uh let okay. me just share my screen again i want to share one thing with everyone so well thanks again lars and our thank next you. edition will be the first one in person so yeah if you are in links or close to links and or if you are willing to come to Lee so on October 19th, uh, Donatrace will host us here in the headquarters. And it will, since we started last year, that will be the first event in person. So uh, yeah, really, really exciting news. So looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for joining. I wish everyone had a great time uh, and yeah, see you next month. Yeah, and um, just one question. Thank you, thank you again. But one question, Marcus, did you somehow, ah, I just found your email. I just copied that before you closed the, the Zoom, the Zoom, uh, yeah, thank you. Ah, okay, <laughs> cool. I'm stopping Bye. the